vast medical landscape of cardiology, neurology, orthopedics, sports medicine, and primary care. Join us here for your prescription to better health. And we're on. Hello, South Florida and beyond. Welcome to the How to Stay Healthy show here on Friday, um, all the way through March here. So we're really moving. Friday, March 23rd. <laughs> so it's, it is really moving this year. We have an action-packed program today. We're going to be talking internal medicine uh, with an internist. That's the way you reference um, an internal medicine doctor, I, as I've learned myself. And... Um, but before we get started, just want to let you know, um, we're always on Facebook Live at All County Healthcare Incorporated's Facebook Live page. If you have any questions for the show or for the doctor, you can type them in there. If they're appropriate, I will ask the doctor on the air, or you can call into 888-565-1470. Just remember, the doctor uh, in studio doesn't have any of your medical records, so they'll just kind of give you um, some possibilities. That's the way I like to describe it, um, about the condition and ailment. So um, without further ado, I want to welcome back to the program, Dr. Bella Kovacs. Dr. Kovacs, how are you doing today? Thank you very much, and I appreciate that you invited me back. Maybe, maybe it says something about the performance last time. You did great. Hey, we got listeners in London, England because of you, so we got to invite you back. That's global. You made me so proud now. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for coming back, because I know last time um, we talked a lot about the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which I want to get into again today. Yep, that's fine. And then, um, but then since then, there there was that wild um, flu outbreak, and we had talked a little bit. And the way that, as a um, journalist, that I saw this this flu outbreak this year is different regions had it worse than others. Some regions were really bad. I know the Palm Beach Gardens region was terrible in that area; was just bad. Then other regions, kind of uh, maybe near you, weren't as bad, but then other regions flared up. So that can happen with the flu. And of course, nationally, we saw the stories um, a little bit nationally. But what I wanted to ask you about is, do you remember a, um, a season like that? So many ups and downs with respiratory infections and, and the flu kind of in and out like that? I mean, uh, This was, I think, a, a unique or extraordinary year or has been. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is when I was here last time, I mentioned it to you that I have not seen too many people too sick in my own practice yet. Well, two things after that. Yes, a lot of people turned sick, and I myself had the flu. And I even had to take a day off, which I probably didn't, hadn't taken before, maybe 10 years. So um, a little egg on my face. <laughs> this, this is wonderful no. in medicine <laughs> because you can never predict what will happen, and you have to be careful in your predictions. And uh, it taught me a lesson again. Yeah, but I know for a fact that you don't get very sick very often because you're in excellent shape. And we're going to talk about um, you, the running that you do almost like on. Uh, you're always in these runs every weekend, it seems, which is great. But, yeah, that would, that strain was was really rough. So yes. um, a lot of people got it. And I was telling you in the green room there that I think I had that upper respiratory infection thing twice um, so yeah, they were both going around and, um, and it just doesn't want to go away the whole season. No, the entire, it just keeps, keeps uh, lingers on. Uh -huh. And hopefully next year we won't be affected uh, by that. Hopefully the next 10 years. We Let me ask you from an internist standpoint, what time of the year, uh, later this year, should we start thinking about the flu shot? Is it September, October -ish? Late, late summer the or, next early, round? or early fall. Okay. That's the recommendation. So if we have an appointment at that time with primary care. Please ask your doctor what okay. he or she thinks of it and discuss it because uh, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. You may have a condition, you may take medications that would make it inappropriate for the doctor to recommend it at that time. And uh, I, I think it, that's, that's why we have on, our own primary care physicians. I went to my own doctor two days ago and mm -hmm. he took the blood and today they called me back, you're doing fine. And now I know how patients feel about it when I call yeah, them. Yeah, now you know. That's why I always tell doctors on here on the radio show, it's going to be over before you know it because that's what you tell us sometimes if you have to you know, give a shot or a, a small procedure. But that is uh, that is great, though, from a primary care standpoint with a doctor with the experience that you have. And we're definitely going to get into that as well. I want to share with the listeners a little bit um, and the viewers, I should say, because we're on YouTube, Facebook Live, we're everywhere, um, a little bit about 
how I first learned about hyperbaric chambers because I'm from the Jupiter area, a lot of fishing, a lot of scuba diving. And um, every year it seemed like there was a couple of cases with uh, divers who had the bends really bad. And that's how I first learned about hyperbaric chambers uh, down the down the street at the big trauma center in the area. I actually didn't dive, so I, I didn't have the problem. I only d- dove once in my life, and luckily, you know, everything was 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 great. But um, I would see it on the news, is what I'm getting to. But now, um, I believe it started with the Navy, but. Um, now hyperbaric chambers are being used for wound healing. Yes, inf- that's, that's the most common one. Um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Oh, what people do during the hurricane is mm-hmm. uh, they put the heater in the room and they run it on gas or diesel, mm-hmm. and the fumes obviously have the carbon monoxide, and then the whole family passes out and they are brought to the emergency room. Yeah, the, the hospital generator. If they are lucky. The generator. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> oh yeah, we've seen that story a few times. Yeah. Cuz carbon monoxide um if you're sleeping it's not something you'll detect. It's just it, it's odorless, it right? It, odorless, it's invisible. Wow. There is no uh, there's no way for you to detect it. That's why uh, many places uh, many places have uh, I, I don't know whether the entire Florida mandates it or not, but I know that in my apartment there is a carbon monoxide uh, detector. Oh yeah, that's good to have. Everyone should have one. I got to get one on the way home. I've been Meaning to do that. I have the fire smoke detector, but not the carbon monoxide. But um, if someone does have that ailment and the ambulance picks them up and brings them to the hospital and, and obviously they're still alive, that's something that would be uh, prescribed as a... Or a, a hyperbaric, a, yes. It's, a, okay. it's very interesting because uh, in a few minutes, uh, the carbon monoxide is removed from the person's bloodstream. Mm-hmm. But it is not removed from the tissues. Okay. And so if you read articles uh, about it, uh, for example, New England Journal of Medicine uh, had an article about it. Uh, if you give more than just one treatment, three or four treatments, the long-term negative neurological uh, consequences mm-hmm. are less severe and less likely to develop. So uh, many patients stop after one because I tell them that there is no more in your blood, no more carbon monoxide in the blood. Uh, but it doesn't mean the tissues also have been cleaned out. So uh, it is re- the New England Journal of Medicine recommends at least three. Tell us a little bit of how it works. I I think um, it has something to do with um, the oxygen in the bloodstream. Uh, the blood gases. Blood uh, gases, Think about okay. your body like a, um, a bottle of uh, sparkling water mm-hmm. uh, that has white glass or plastic around it, usually glass, Um, And what happens is when you remove the cap, all of a sudden, the pressure inside that bottle is reduced. So less gases uh, can Mm -hmm. be dissolved in the water, so they build up bubbles. The very same thing happens with the bends in your blood. Bubbles develop, they do not allow the blood to flow to, to the organs, and that's why you start having pains and neurological uh, complaints and problems. That, that's how simple. Now, what the hyperbaric does, and how we, uh, starting with the Navy, uh, is we put the genie back in the bottle. We increase the pressure, so we dissolve those bubbles in the liquid again. And then very slowly, under controlled circumstances, we release you, you breathe it out, actually. That's I what see. happens. But first, you have to put it back, the genie back into the bottle. You, <laughs> you see, the genie can uh, be put back in the bottle. That's a great way. Well, I actually <laughs> understand it because of that. I really and, do. And, then, and, and then, then you breathe it out slowly. That's why when you dive, you have to come up slowly. And if you discover that you forgot to look at your tank and suddenly there is no more uh, gas, no more oxygen or compressed air in your tank, and you have to come up because it, you're gonna die if you stay down there, um, that, that's the first thing that they do. They put you back into the, uh, the, the chamber and dissolve the gases again, because at higher I pressure, see. you can dissolve more gases in a liquid. Okay. And that's exactly the same thing like your soda pop, when mm-hmm. you open it up and it gives that popping sound and the foam comes out. Okay. Now, how, how can you put it back? You put it in a hyperbaric chamber. Oh, that's uh, I do understand it now. And I see on the screen, um, 
your uh, 24 hour service. So if anyone has any friends or family, this um, hypothetically, if this happens, you know, uh, this weekend, give Dr. Uh, Kovacs a call. 954-484-1111 and you actually as a doctor prescribe um, a treatment to the hyperbaric chamber the and patient obviously would have to be brought uh, to the emergency room I okay. do not recommend anybody himself or herself to bring a person in just dial 911 okay. the patient comes to the hospital and the hospital has the chamber and uh, uh, there is a technician on call and uh, the emergency room doctors some of them are hyperbaric certified and uh, they know what has to be done and uh, i see and that's how it works uh, please do not take anybody yourself with, if you suspect that something like that could have happened uh, do not take anybody yourself in the back of your back seat of your car because the outcome may be yeah sad okay then i i got that a little wrong though but if you need dr kovacs he is available 24 hours at that number um but I think well, how I got it mixed up. Do you, from time to time, work in the hyperbaric? Yes. Okay, that's where I had it from last time. I apologize about that. I don't want to give out the wrong information. Tell us a little bit about where this um, chamber is at. Is that the hospital you're on it staff is at? In Florida Medical Center. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's just a very neat little machine. It's a, a tubular structure. The whole body goes in. Uh, the patient lies down on a stretcher, and the top of the stretcher on a rail uh, allows the uh, technician to push in the patient with that uh, bed-like structure there on it. We close the door, and then we turn up the pressure, and uh, within eight or ten minutes, the patient is usually at two, two and a half atmospheric pressure, and that's what most people need. Okay. Um, some patients with carbon monoxide may need more, usually up to three atmosphere. Uh, there are patients who cannot tolerate it or cannot tolerate it well um, when the pressure goes up, so it takes a longer time. And then there are techniques that the technician can, can tell uh, the patient to try. Uh, your ears usually pop. It's very similar when you fly on an airplane. Uh, the inside of the airplane is obviously pressurized because at 35,000, foot elevation, there's practically no pressure and no oxygen anyhow. So the air, airliner, uh, the airline is usually, or the airplane is usually pressurized at 8,000 foot uh, level. So your eardrum feels the difference between the middle ear inside and the outer pressure in the cabin. And that's why when you fly, you may have earache. And that's why it is recommended that if you have an upper respiratory infection, you probably should not fly unless it's very important for you to, to do, or ask your doctor to give something like a, a decongestant that allows that pressure gradient to disappear. And I don't want to go into the details no. how it works. That was a great explanation, though. But, I always wondered that's, why. That's years. what you feel in the airplane. That's exactly the same that you would feel in the hyperbaric chamber. We're here with Dr. Bella Kovacs. He's an internist. Um, on staff at Florida Medical Center, a campus in North Shore, a great hospital there in Fort Lauderdale. I wanted to ask you one more thing about um, the hyperbaric chamber, oxygen hyperbaric chamber. Um, can this help with wound care, diabetic foot ulcers, those kind of things as well? as uh, I guess that's an infection. Uh, absolutely. Uh, with diabetic foot ulcers, the majority of the patients I, I have seen at Florida Medical Center great majority of the patients had diabetic foot ulcers. And mm -hmm. I personally would like to recommend to everybody who is diabetic and either the primary care doctor or an infectious disease doctor, an orthopedic doctor, a podiatrist, a foot doctor, tells them, tells him, her, that uh, the person has a diabetic foot ulcer. It usually uh, the most common site is the ball of the foot uh, where the midfoot meets the base of the toes. And uh, if, they, if the person has, if the patient has that problem, I would very warmly recommend uh, to uh, consider going for a hyperbaric evaluation. It doesn't necessarily mean the person needs it. It doesn't mean the person is able to get it. There are contraindications. A pregnant woman, for example, couldn't get it. Uh, a pregnancy is a contraindication. Or a person who has what is called bullous emphysema. Uh, emphysema is a lung problem, usually develops from smoking. Uh, that person would be, it would be dangerous for that person to go into that 
pressure because when the pressure is reduced, uh, those air chambers in the lung may rupture and that person may end up with a pneumothorax, which means a collapsed lung. And that would be a potentially life-threatening problem. So nothing is automatic. I would like to recommend that those patients go for an evaluation without any commitment of doing anything, just acquiring the knowledge and the advice of someone who knows the issues. That's great. And it's the hyperbaric oxygen chamber at Florida Medical Center campus in North Shore in Fort Lauderdale. I believe the website is floridamedicalctr.com and you can get more information there. Dr. Kovacs is listed there if you want to uh, click in the, the physician um, finder or um, I'm going to give out his info here a few more times during the broadcast. Um, we're going to take a quick um, commercial break on the other side, um, talk to Dr. Kovacs a little bit about his experience. He worked at two nursing homes, and that, that's important because they've got a huge geriatric population as well. And um, I want to talk to him a little bit, uh, talking to an internist before starting a weight loss program on the How to Stay Healthy show. All County Healthcare, Inc. is locally owned and operated, serving the Tri-County area, Palm Beach, Dade, and Broward Counties for the last 25 years. The practice of medicine is changing dramatically. All County Healthcare, Inc. still does it the old-fashioned way, where our nurses and healthcare professionals come into your home to service your medical needs, providing you the fastest and best care possible. For more information, call 954-717-717. 7027. And remember, Medicare Home Care is covered by Part A of Medicare with no out of pocket cost to you. It's your decision and only your decision on what health care agency you use. Call today, All County Home Health Care Inc. at 954 717 7027. License 2009096. How to stay healthy. It's a question asked by many people and answered by few. On how to stay healthy with David DePino, I'm going to bring you the latest in health news by interviewing top doctors from South Florida and around the world. Tune in on Fridays at 5.30 p.m. right here on WWNN Radio 95.3 FM and 1470 AM, the Health and Wealth Network, to hear the latest health treatments and my curveball question of the hobbies and passions in life doctors pursue when not providing medicine. And now back to how to stay healthy your weekly doctor's interview and prescription to better health. Hello, South Florida and beyond. And we're back with Dr. Bella Kovacs. He's an internist. So internal medicine in Fort Lauderdale um, is number. I'm going to give it out a few times. Well, Dr. Kovacs, you go ahead and give it out because I misplaced your card there. <laughs> it's an easy number, 954-484-1111. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, I want to talk to you because um, you treat, obviously, as a primary care, you treat patients of, of pretty much all ages, adult ages, right? Yes. So um, you have a unique experience of um, medical director at two nursing homes, so you've dealt with the geriatric yes. population. That That is great experience um, to have because, um, as everyone knows in South Florida, we have a you know very large geriatric population because I think it has a lot to do with the weather. People come down because, I mean, you could tell me if that's true or not, but um, I think that's great experience. Um, now I've um, been here in Florida for 35 years now because of the weather. Because <laughs> exactly of the weather. Exactly because of the weather. Yeah, because um, I've been here my whole life, so I don't know anything else, but I don't want to leave, to be honest with you. Great um, place. Now, um... Tell us a little bit also, um, let's let's kind of do a scenario. We were talking on the phone. Um, so if a patient has a, a broken hip, we were kind of talking, you know, as they're discharged from the hospital, there's a, a plan that should go on. Obviously, they're going to go back to their primary care, but sometimes there's rehabilitation, there's home health, there can be assisted living. Um, I think kind of what your background was in for years and years ago um, as the medical director at two nursing homes physical therapy, um, there's all kinds of things. And then you were telling me on the phone, it's going to be a little different for someone 25 years old and who's a football player versus someone who's 84 and um, just broke their hip may have osteoporosis, right? Absolutely. It's, it's very interesting. And I, I would like to mention it that I have learned over the years that there is a system 
in spite of what many people say. Uh, and the system is designed very well to work for the patient. Uh, it is very important to know the system and how to work in that system. Uh, indeed, let's see that an 80-year-old person, uh, usually a woman, because uh, at 80, a woman's bones are more uh, likely to break than a man's bones. And that's maybe another subject and another time. <laughs> osteoporosis. <laughs> osteoporosis. And uh, some, a, a woman falls at 80-year-old woman and breaks a hip. Uh, comes to the hospital, let's suppose she is lucky and she doesn't need a total hip replacement, which is a much bigger operation, just needs two or three screws put into the hip. Uh, and that's a much smaller operation. The incision line is smaller, the trauma is less, and the hospital stay doesn't require uh, such a length as it would be in the other instance. So then where can that person go? Now, it depends on the circumstances. The most likely scenario is that uh, the doctor who admitted the patient would recommend rehabilitation. Now, where would the rehabilitation take place? Uh, the highest level of rehabilitation would be in a rehab hospital. Uh, for example, uh, Health South Sunrise Rehab Hospital in Sunrise or St. Uh, Anthony's, um, St. John's at uh, uh, very close to Florida Medical Center, uh, just east of 441 on Oakland Park Boulevard. And these are places that require that the person be able to work two hours very hard every day and a little less on the weekends, but every day. Um, I don't know whether an 80-year-old person uh, would be immediately uh, qualified for this because maybe the 80-year-old person was not physically very fit. Uh, so then comes the next possibility, a skilled nursing facility. Nursing homes have usually two different type of patients. One is custodial patients who live their entire life there because they need care to that degree. Uh, and maybe the family members are not able to, uh, to stay home and do that work themselves. Um, and the other is the rehab area, which is skilled nursing facility. Uh, they give you uh, physical therapy one hour a day usually and maybe not on the weekend. So most 80-year-olds would be qualified for this skilled nursing facility. Now then after a few weeks, when the wound has healed, the person is able to walk. There is physical therapy, for example. You know, physical therapy is given for the lower extremities and occupational therapy is given for the upper extremities. And then there is mm. speech therapy. So a person had a stroke, the person needs lower extremity, upper extremity, and speech therapy. But with a hip, usually just physical therapy. And then when the patient is doing well, the patient can go home, either alone or with family members, and home care would be involved, and they continue the rehabilitation at home for a while, or the person can go back to an assisted living where the person originally lived. Or if the person did not live in an assisted living but lived alone at home, I would recommend to that person to consider living in an assisted living facility. And there are assisted living facilities of every kind, uh, from not too very expensive to really expensive. Mm -hmm. And there are different levels in an assisted living facility, how much help that person needs. And then let's suppose at the end, everything turns out all right, and the patient goes home and is rehabilitated, drives the car again, goes to Publix again, and uh, goes to the beach, hopefully. Quality of life. That's what yes, you want to get the patient to. Yep, that's why we're down here. So, but that was a great explanation because there's different paths people have to take mattering on the ailment um, that they may have suffered or the injury, I should say. So to have a you know a great primary care doctor like you um, involved with the process, that's great, and um, you know the hospital as well. But um, it's it's good to know you know there's there's different avenues and that there's. There's a plan. And you guys system, are experts. You know the, the system. The system is set up for the patient, mm -hmm. and it does work. Okay. That's great to know. I'm going to turn it a little bit. I'm actually a yo-yo dieter. I am. I'm going to admit it. Never lost the weight from football, uh, playing football, American football. But um, thing is, though, I've um, finally kind of found a plan that worked. 
Should I talk to my primary care before starting a weight loss program? And if so, why? We always hear that maybe on a commercial or something. Always talk to your doctor before starting a weight loss program. Why? It, it depends if it has to do only with diet itself. What oh. kind of food you eat, how much food you eat. Or, or it also involves some kind of physical activity, increased level of physical activity. I personally think that, that this is a great subject to discuss when you go to your doctor. Now, should you go to a doctor every month or every three months if you're 20 years old and healthy and you don't have any problem? Probably not. No. Uh, should you go to a doctor every three months if you're 80 year old? Probably yes. Okay. Now, in between, there is a whole variety of patients and there are young people who are not doing well and then there are older people who are in fabulous condition. Uh, so, yes, I would talk to my doctor and I would discuss a couple of things. How much fluid, I, uh, how much would be, or should be my, or what should be my fluid intake? Uh, you don't want to get dehydrated. You don't want to have electrolyte imbalance. Uh, so that's important. What type of food should I have? Does it help you if you lose all your muscle mass because you are not eating protein? No, it is probably not very good for you. Should you eat a lot of carbohydrate if you're diabetic? No, you should not. So I, I think these are the things that, that you and your doctor could sit down and maybe you bring in some cookies for the doctor and, and a bottle of wine, the two of you sit down <laughs> and, and you discuss the, the cookie diet and, and the alcohol. Yeah, which I know you have to watch, but that was very gracious though. I got to say that. Um, and then let's talk about a little bit of what about you, you do as a doctor to stay in shape because I started the program by telling the listeners and viewers that every time I have you on, you're running like a 5K or half marathon or, or tri. Uh, I know you don't do the triathlon. Duathlon. Duathlon as well. So what are you doing tomorrow morning? Uh, it, there's a 5K and also there's a health marathon. Uh, I don't do health marathons. They are a little uh, longer distances than what I feel comfortable. Uh, but I do 5 to 10K. Uh, that's 3 to 6 miles. And in Coral Springs, there is a health marathon and a 5K, and it's for women's uh, wellness, uh, dedicated for them. It's at the uh, western end of Royal Palm Boulevard, uh, just before the Sogress uh, Expressway. I, I try to do it because when my patients ask me, okay, you recommend that I be more active physically, what do you do? and so that I would be able to tell them that I do it myself and encourage them slowly to work themselves into those programs. Okay, that's great to know. We have less than a minute. It's hard to believe that we went through a whole 30 minutes, but we got to have you back on. And my goal is to get to the point and start a 5K with you right next to me. I'm not going to be able to keep up with you because I know you're fast. Don't but, underestimate hey, yourself. That's a don't. goal. No, definitely. A I want to run again. Player, don't and underestimate yourself. But thanks again for coming on the show. You're always welcome on the How to Stay Healthy show. And we'll see you next time. Thank you uh, very much. Check out Dr. Bella Kovacs if you have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. For a prescription to better health from the top doctors in the medical fields of cardiology, neurology, orthopedics, sports medicine, and primary care, Join us each week on the How to Stay Healthy Show. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management,